can data make me a better basketball rebounder? I've been playing basketball since I can walk, but over the years, I've come to grips with parts of my game. I'm 5'7", 150 on a good week, and coming off an ACL injury. So if I'm not dropping 20 points a game, how else do I get on the court? I've kind of been doing what every other short kid in my position has done, pass it to the better player and play good defense. Now, two weeks ago, I watched two videos that got me inspired. First, I rewatched ESPN's brilliant documentary, The Last Dance, where Dennis Rodman, one of the greatest defenders of all time, gave a now famous explanation of his approach to rebound. It's practice a lot about the angle of the ball and what you three up. You got a Larry Bird, it's going to spin. You got a, a Magic, and maybe spin. When Michael shoot over here, I position myself right there. Now I hit the rim, it's boom, uh. So don't get it messed up. Dennis was a nerd. He had rebounding down to a science. And then maybe a couple hours after watching that, I came across Patrick Winston's famous MIT lecture, How to Speak, where only a minute into the lecture he says this. Your speaking, your writing, is largely determined by this formula. It's a matter of how much knowledge you have, how much you practice with that knowledge, and your inherent talent. And notice that the T is very small. What really matters is what you know. Seeing that formula on the chalkboard really put Dennis Rodman's career and really any successful career into a new perspective. And that brought me back to my own game. I play pickup twice a week at my local gym where I play with a group of guys around my skill level. So I asked myself one question, can I gain more knowledge to make me a better basketball player? And more specifically, could analyzing data about pickup games make me a better rebound? I've been doing data analytics and automation since college, and I always wanted to break into data science. So I made this video to combine two interests of mine and maybe teach you a thing or two about my approach. You might have clicked this video because you like basketball, or you're curious about data science, or both. In this video, I will show you my journey and domestify some concepts about data science, data analysis, and machine learning for total beginners along the way. Let's get into it. When you go through any data-driven project, you will likely experience the five steps data science lifecycle. I'm going to clearly walk you through each of these in this project. The first step is defining and understanding the problem, and that starts with a great hypothesis. Could analyzing data about pickup basketball games make me a better rebound? I'm committed to the theory that the location of a shot and the location of a rebound have a strong enough correlation to make a prediction. So, if I collect enough data on the two, I could become a better rebounder. And then, ideally, I can build an app where I can click somewhere on a digital basketball court, then after some machine learning magic, the app can tell me the best location on the court to position my body. So where do I get all this shot and rebound location data? Data is everywhere. Data comes in all shapes and sizes. Watching videos, coaching advice, and reading spreadsheets are all forms of data. So lesson one, picking your data is super crucial. When I started this project, I made this exact mistake of picking the wrong data, and I stumbled upon this Patreon guy who logged thousands of shots and rebound location data in the NBA. I thought, perfect, exactly what I need. But wait a second, is this really helpful? Remember, I'm trying to use data to make me a better rebounder in my pickup games. So why would I use data from the NBA, a league that has longer shooting, shooters with a softer touch, and giants who could grab boards at much closer distance? This brings me to lesson number two, use your intuition. I knew NBA data is different from data at pickup games because I've played and watched basketball my whole life. This makes me understand the problem better than someone who isn't a certified baller. This dead end made me truly understand the problem. If I want to be a better rebounder in my pickup basketball games, I need data that closely resembles my pickup basketball games. I need shot and rebound location data from amateur basketball players. The data must be in-game shots. Shoot-around data is not the same as in-game. And lastly, I need the data in an indoor gym, because if you ever played on an outside rim, you know the bounce is completely different. So now that I understand my desired outcome and data set, it's time to collect the data. Due to my data collection requirements, I'm fully responsible for collecting all of the data for this project. So I started asking myself questions like, how much data should I collect? What will the data look like? And how will I collect the data? All these questions are quite interrelated. The answer to how much data I should collect is quite simple, as much as possible. This is not the time to be picky. For what the data looks like, I imagined a court and a spreadsheet in my head. One shot is marked with an XY coordinate, and one rebound is marked with an XY coordinate. That creates one row in my spreadsheet. Adding many rows creates a tabular data set. This is an example of structured data. 
And my rule of thumb is if it can be placed in rows and columns, it's structured data. Data scientists often prefer working with structured data because it's standardized, follows a persistent order, and can be read by humans and computers alike. It's not lost on me that this is a very simple data set. I have two inputs, what I know, in order to predict two outputs, the rebound xy. You can have tens, hundreds, and even millions of input-output variables. In rebounding alone, there are so many possible inputs that could predict the location of the rebound. NBA teams are investing millions into visual tracking technology to get data-driven insights like these all over the court. I do not have the luxury of that tech, so you know what I did? I kept it simple. I drove to my local library, printed out a basketball court, went to see pickup games at the JCC, and physically documented every missed shot. I figured a computer could compute the XY coordinates later. I came up with a useful numbering and circling system, but it became pretty overwhelming to track. So I went home and built my own web app to make the data tracking quicker and more accurate. Red marks the location of the shot and blue marks the location of the rebound. I hit add row and the data appears in the table, just how I visualized it in my head. This table could then be saved for next steps in the life cycle. The link to the app and the code is in the description below. The next time I went to the gym, I had my iPad ready to go. This entire experience of going from spreadsheet design to building ways to ingest data is known as data engineering. Data engineers make a living designing and building ways to collect and use data in the later phases of data science. Although simple, what I was doing is engineering data. As you learn more about big data, you will learn about all these valuable tools and technologies out there. But for me, I kept it simple. After two weeks of recording data at my local pickup games, I recorded 329 missed shots with their respective rebound locations. Time to clean this baby up. Generally speaking, data cleaning is the process of fixing incorrect, incomplete, and irrelevant data from the data set. This happens all the time. In the real world, there is no such thing as clean data. It happens from human error, automation error, connecting multiple data sources, or the data engineers and the data scientists simply being misaligned. Data scientists say 60% of their job is data cleaning. Even though I personally engineered the data for this project, I still have unclean data. Check out the app that I made. You see I only rendered half of the basketball court. This is because both sides of the court are identical, so I figured this would simplify my data preparation. But when I added logic to flip the court, I realized the coordinate logic would be all messed up. I concluded it would be too much of a pain to fix it in the app, so I decided to add a column that tells me if the data was on the north or south side of the digital court. This way, I could rotate the coordinate logic 180 degrees at the cleaning phase with a little formula. And yes, I'm doing all of this in a spreadsheet. Keep it simple. All right, Workbench Benny here. I'm inside of Google Sheets for some analysis. So I moved the raw data into this Google Sheet and then I moved it into this tab right here to be able to clean it using that Excel formula that I mentioned before. And this whole sheet is going to be in the description where you can check it out and create a copy for yourself. Moving to the scatter section, I flattened the data so I could be able to easily create this scatter plot of the shots in red and the rebounds in blue. And you see it's kind of what we're expecting. And even though I can overlay the basketball court on top of it, you can easily see roughly where the arc is going to be. So this is pretty good data, but I wanted to be able to enhance it a little bit to be able to ask some questions like the three point percentage, two point percentage, percentage the shots inside of eight feet. So I went over to Python to be able to do a little bit more data manipulation. And with the help of ChatGPT, I was able to basically construct the best guess of a three point arc inside of the data point, and then be able to classify each data point as a two point attempt or a three point attempt. Scrolling further, I was able to use a couple formulas to be able to measure the distance inside of feet. And that brought me over to this tab over here, which is the enhanced data tab, which I think is probably the coolest part, where everything left of this gray column is the shot X, Y and that information, and then the rebound information on the right. The first question I wanted to ask though is, what's the percentage of a weak rebound? So a weak rebound is when the shot is, for example, on the left-hand side, and then the rebound is on the right-hand side, the weak side of the shot. I did construct a quick formula that first removed all of the shots in the center, because I didn't want that to influence the data too much. So I built this formula that basically said all the shots that are very left or very right, go ahead and run this calculation to see if it's a strong or weak rebound. 
And then that formula was able to give me this weak rebound percentage right here, 57.21%. So what the data is saying is that 60% of shots on the very left-hand side will probably end up on the right, and then vice versa. Here's some other quick analytics that I did, like locating the percentage of all two-point attempts and the percentage of all three-point attempts. I was able, also able to construct this formula that gave me the shots within eight feet. Now, one last quick analysis I wanted to do was rebounds for tired rebounders. I get tired at the end of games, so what I wanted to know was show me all of the shots in which the rebound was greater than 10 feet, so I can just chill on the arc and wait for the rebound to come. So I moved this into a new tab where I created this filter that said, hey, show me all shots where the rebound distance is greater than 10 feet, and then plot all of the shots. And this is probably three-point arc shots, again, validating information that I already knew. If you have a shot that goes long, physics tells you it's probably going to go back in a long distance or angle. So if somebody's taking a three-point shot, I might be able to chill. But if somebody is inside the paint, I better crash the board. And that does it for analysis. Let's get to the ML model. Notice how much we've done in a data science project and we're only now getting to machine learning models, which are programs that can find patterns or make decisions from a previously unseen dataset. Although models are perhaps the most academically rigorous part of data science, it only makes up a tiny part of the project. There are thousands of free learning materials on models and algorithms out there, and if you want a beginner's guide to machine learning, I recommend Microsoft's free course on GitHub. If you want to know more about the math underneath, maybe brush up on statistics and linear algebra. Another way you can learn is to befriend smart people, like I did with Brian, a professional data scientist. I interviewed him about this project and he said this. So you, you, when you're given a problem in data science, you usually can bin it into two categories, regression or classification. But classification is given numbers and you create an output that classifies that piece of information. Is a shooting guard shooting this or is a center shooting exactly. this? Exactly. In this case, we want not label, but we want numbers. So this is a regression problem. The way I would initially approach it is just by doing a simple regression. I would start with a linear regression based on like X, Y inputs. Can you predict X, Y outputs? If you just had A and B and you wanted to predict the relationship between those and the algorithm is finding the line as the minimal amount of error from reality. The whole point of that line is to best represent that relationship, find the best fit, and in this case, in data science, you usually would do what's called um, train test split. Let's say that you have 100 games. You want to build a model, and you build that on the 80 games. If you were to then test that model based on the data of the 80 games, what we're going to do is we're going to take those last 20 games, and we're going to use those not to train the model, but we're going to use them as inputs to the model. It's a vibe check. <laughs> Yes, it, it's a vibe check for the reality. So I'm gonna walk you through a simple linear regression where I'll train the model with 80% of my clean data and test it with the other 20%. So let's build that linear regression model. Here I am inside of Python and I've been working on this for a few hours now. I put it inside of Jupyter. If you're not familiar with Python, I highly recommend taking an intro course and then going back to this code where you can see all of my comments inside of the GitHub. Looking at the top, you can see libraries that I'm able to bring in. Notice that I don't have to code linear regression, but what, rather I'm using this library called sklearn. This is a huge part of programming of being able to use other people's codes to get to what you want to get to. Here I'm able to bring in that CSV file of all of my enhanced data, and then run a correlation matrix on the numeric values that I thought might have correlation. And it's not looking good. If you look at the last two columns, and you want those numbers to be as close to one, basically saying that there is a heavy correlation, either positive or negative, towards a field on the left-hand side. This is already telling me that my hypothesis that shot X and shot Y will likely not have a strong, accurate output of the expected rebound X and rebound Y. Now, this doesn't make the project an outright failure, but we're learning. So let's continue and build a linear regression. You see here I'm setting shot x and shot y as input variables in order to get the two output variables rebound x and rebound y. Then I perform train test split, create a linear reg regression, and then train the model on that training data. From there, I'm able to take the 20% that I saved as the test data and then run a y prediction on it. 
This gives me the R square score, which is about 0 0.04. And this tells me how close the values are or the error is to the line inside of the linear regression. Now 0 0.04 is a terrible number. <laughs> it should again be around 0 0.8, 0 0.9 to really tell you that you're going to get a strong prediction. But hey, no worries. I had a theory that maybe if I created two separate models, one for just rebound X and one for just rebound Y, then I can combine those two models together and then be able to get a much more accurate prediction. If you look at that correlation matrix above, there was a little bit of hope for rebound Y, where you could see that there is some correlation with shot Y and shot distance feet. So I just made those two values the inputs in order to get rebound Y, and that gave me an R squared score of 0 0.088, a much higher score, but again, not too great. And then after playing around with some information for X, I was able to get information and 0 0.001 was as high as I could possibly get for rebound X. So that sucks. But hey, we made it this far in the video, so let's just go ahead and build that function of give me shot X and shot Y and go ahead and give me that prediction of rebound X and rebound Y. And here's the formula right here. And if I run an example coordinate like 82, 273, then it outputs me 302, 489, and I created the image as you can see below. I played around with a lot of test data and the rebound location is basically all inside of the paint. And that makes sense because I couldn't find a strong enough correlation with any inputs and outputs in the data. So the model's biased towards the mean center of all of the rebound data. So with this underwhelming result, I thought maybe I didn't have enough data points, which is likely because I really only had about 300 rows. So I brought in that 7,000 plus NBA tracking data sheet to kind of compare it against. I ran a correlation matrix and similar underwhelming results. So maybe you're just not going to get a good prediction if you only have two variables, shot X and shot Y, to predict rebound X and rebound Y. Maybe you need to bring in more of those advanced features like spin, arc, fatigue to make a better prediction model. But this is the secret extra step to data science. I'm going to have to iterate and go back up to step one to understand my problem, to gather data, to clean the data, and then run the modeling again in order to get a better estimate. There's no such thing as the perfect model, and there's no such thing as finished work in data science. Looking back on my first data science project, there's a couple things I did well, and there's a few things I wish I had. First, I think I did a good job understanding my hypothesis and narrowing down on a data set. And during data collection, I'm proud that I built a way to ingest the shot and rebound data as well as I could in a quality and structured way. Although I wish I had a lot more data. Data cleaning gave me some cool insights like learning about two pointers versus three pointers, but my modeling proved that there's really no correlation between shot data and rebound data to make an accurate prediction. I wish I had more of those advanced inputs that could lead to a better correlation. I also wish I had a way to measure the efficacy or the performance of my model to prove or disprove that the project is actually making me a better rebounder, but I have no easy way to track the past and future of my rebound performance. Lastly, I wish I had more time to do all the things I wish I could, but this isn't my full-time job. Other parts of work and life are going to get in the way. I've always believed that data science, programming, and really anything else you want to learn to improve your career should be taught alongside a passion of yours. For me, it was basketball. But for you, it might be cooking, traveling, music. But remember that data is everywhere. Try searching for that passion of yours on Kaggle, try to find a free data set, or better yet, come up with a data engineering project of your own. And please drop a comment below. I'd love to support you in any way that I can. Thank you so much for watching. What makes a great rebounder? I would say the first thing that makes a great rebounder is effort. If you don't have that, you're not gonna get any rebounds. It matters where they shoot from on the court. If it's a three, I'll be farther away for the rebound, but if it's like a layup, I'll be closer in to try to get the rebounds. It's pretty obvious that you can tell like if it's gonna be short or long, but then you have to take into account like where is it gonna hit on the rim. Additionally, the arc of the ball, a ball shot higher is gonna bounce higher off the rim. A ball shot flatter, bounce hard off the rim, but go more around the court. If someone's shooting from the corner, chances are it's going to probably end up a little bit more in the middle and on the other side. The spin of the ball, how the ball is shot. Uh, oh, so I think you're going to have some fun slicing and dicing all of that out. I'll figure that out. Guys, thank you. I appreciate it.